Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Stephen Tragus. I'm the director of One Day University. I would like to welcome you. Uh, the director of the Kaufman Center will be out before the second half, and she will welcome you as well. But I just want to quickly explain what's going on here. Uh, most, about half of you came through One Day University, where, as you know, we try and send you to college for just one day, but no homework or exams or studying. We get rid of those things because no one liked them anyway. And we just bring you fascinating professors who will entertain you about all different types of subjects. In the last few years, we've started partnering with various groups all over New York and a few other places as well. And we have worked with the Metropolitan Museum and we have worked with New York Historical Society, we've worked with the Museum of Art and Design, we've worked with the Morgan Center, but our absolute favorite is to work with the Kaufman Center. And I think you will see why. You will be hearing our professor discussing music, but instead of just pushing a button and hearing it on tape, you're gonna hear playing that is just gonna blow you away. So I won't take up more of your time. Please enjoy, thank you for coming. And thank you for coming. My name is Oren Grossman, and I'm delighted to be working with the Kaufman Center and One Day University and these very, very talented musicians. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the format. We have three great pieces of chamber music today. Mozart, first movement of uh, his G minor piano quartet, the Brahms uh, C minor piano quartet, the third movement, and then uh, we'll take an intermission at that point, and we'll have uh, come back for Astor Piazzolla and his Argentinian tangos, uh, the third thing. Now, chamber music, most of you probably know. It's basically music for at least two people and up to, a six, up to about six, most commonly three, four, five. One of the key things is there's no doubling. They're, they're, you know, everybody's playing their own part, and that's fundamental to chamber music. It lacks a few things that we associate with big, big works. One of the few things it lacks is the identification with one hero who's going to walk onto that stage, you know, like you know, in the old days, Franz Liszt or Horowitz or someone. Or, you know, they walk out on that stage and they beat that piano into submission. Or, you know, and, and, and it's basically, it, there's a real strong audience identification with one central player. It also lacks the big power uh, uh, of a giant orchestra. You know, it just has a huge kind of impressive sound regardless of what they're playing. You know, just that big, big, powerful sound. And of course, it lacks the, the sense of a storyline, usually. There's a couple of pieces where there's a backstory. In fact, even in the Brahms, there's a bit of a backstory that I'll explain, but, but mostly it's sort of pure music. And uh, so it also doesn't have that identification. So what, what does it have that's special? I think partly because because, it's, um, because it isn't for a giant mass audience, at least originally, chamber music is often the vehicle for a composer's most intimate thoughts and, 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 and his most personal kinds of expression. It's a, it's a bit analogous to, you know, artists sometimes say, you know, that a big, a big finished painting that was meant for some king or some of the pope or something, it's, it's all polished, it's all finished and all that. But the, but the painter's drawings, drawings are often a faster, uh, a faster kind of uh, signal right into the artist's inner thoughts. And I think that's, uh, that, that's sort of analogous to how chamber music functions in the larger musical world. Now, Mozart wrote this piece right after Haydn, Joseph Haydn had kind of established a new format of chamber music that, that sort of holds for a long, long time, which is the usual metaphor is that, it, that uh, it's kind of a conversation among equals. So in chamber music, uh, ever since Haydn developed his string quartets, um, that the idea has been, one of the ideas has been that it's a conversation among equals. A little harder when the piano's involved, because the piano's a bit of a bully. I, I, I know Adam won't be bullying here, but you know, got two hands playing away and lots of chords and lots of stuff, so composers do have to think a little bit about that, and I'll point out a few places where, where Mozart and Brahms, you know, you know, make sure that the piano doesn't get little, over, go over the top, 
But most of it's obvious in, as to how they, how they work it out. Nobody gets left out. You know, in some of the older pieces before Haydn, the cello would get left out a bit, be there just to play a bass note, you know. And, uh, and so making the cello equivalent or the viola might get left out of the, the interesting stuff and was all given to the high, the high violin. That ends with Haydn, and Mozart picks up from that where they really are equals. There's another way in which chamber music um, becomes like conversation that's more subtle. And I'll get to that as we go through some examples. So the basic format is I'll have some examples of the piece. I'll ask them to play some examples, and I'll talk a bit about them and see if I can point out some of the, what I think of as the most, you know, some of the interesting and important things to follow as, you, as you're listening. And, uh, and then um, I'll, I'll, I'll shut up and they'll play the piece because I think it's very important to hear once, we, once I take it apart just a little bit, uh, we'll put it back together again and we'll hear the, the whole movement. And we'll do that with both the Mo we'll do that with the Mozart, and then we'll take a one minute break. We'll all stretch just for a minute, and we'll won't leave at all. We'll come right back and we'll do the Brahms and a similar kind of process. And then we'll have a real intermission at that point. So let's 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 uh, let's start. So here we have the Brahms, I mean sorry, the Mozart G minor quartet. It begins with a very dramatic statement. How about hearing example one? This is the opening of the quartet. You want to? Oh, you, I, are you all tuned up, or you, you want to take a little moment? You know, string string players love to tune. <laughs> I'll tell you something. They could be all tuned backstage; they'll still want to tune. That's just the way they are. Nobody knows why. A very strong opening melody, really in sort of two two parts. You have everybody playing together in, in total unison, so that it's very very dramatic and very easy to follow. And the piano answers almost like a little answer, a little statement, and a, and a kind of response from the piano with the coming down quite quickly, coming down. If you know the term, the scale coming right down the scale. Uh, and each of them, each 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 thing though, both the first thing they all do together, and when Adam comes down. They each end with this da 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 da, da, da that little just that little phrase. Play it again. Let's let's hear example one again. You notice the end of each little phrase. Da da, a little sighing motive. Not that important right now, but uh, we'll see what happens later. <laughs> All right. Now let's hear example two. In example two, just let me say one word about it. The 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 idea of the strings together, all together, answered by the piano alone, is one of the common ways to balance out the natural the natural uh, kind of uh, strength of the piano. All the strings together, you know, balanced out against the piano. So let's hear example two. Yeah, that seems a little different, but actually, you, you, Adam, could you just start your, when you come in, da 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 da, just play that. That's it, yeah. Yeah. And in, the ver in the example one, that was his beginning, right? Da -dum -ba -dum. And now when you come in, what do you do? Ah, smooths it out. Smooths out the very same thing. Mozart takes that da -dum -da -dum, smooths it out, it's gentler. It's a different way of saying what he had said the first time in a way. All right? So, 
And then he sort of convinces the strings to go along with him. <laughs> they go with him. And they start doing it, and you'll hear that da da ba bum ba dum bum bum that, that octave thing. He gets them to do it. Gentle persuasion. Let's hear example two again. Now, the next thing that's going to happen is, again, we're going to have the strings and the piano bounce back a, the fragment of that opening melody. And I might as well use one musical term. When you take a melody uh, and start chopping it up and using just a bit of it, a portion of it, enough time so that you can pretty much expect an audience to figure out, I've heard that before, that's called the motive. And the most famous motive in all of music history is the, the Beethoven's Fifth, because it opens with it, right? Da, 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 da. And that symphony uses that over and over and over again. That's a very obsessive use of a motive. So um, we'll hear it again. And then the piano, after they toss it back and forth a few times, the piano seems to start it again, only it sounds very lyrical. It has a different feel to it. Let's hear example three. So after a kind of hushed strings, and the piano quite strongly answers, but then when the piano takes that rather lyrical moment, it's still the same motive, right? Da, 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 da. It's the same bum, 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 da, da. <laughs> very different. This is, I think, very significant about how, uh, how conversation works in musical terms, in musical terms. When you have a good conversation, you might agree on a general subject you're talking about, and one person feels rather strongly about it. Maybe another person has a, has a well, I'm not so sure about that. Maybe another person talking about it has a joke about it. Maybe another person comes in. If everybody had exactly the same opinion and said it exactly the same way all the time, well, we've had these <laughs> We've all been there, right? We've all been there. But in a really good conversation, People come in with a little, oh, I'm not so sure about that, or maybe a gentler way of saying it, or maybe they might start a thought that, 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 you've, uh, that somebody's expressed, but kind of veer off to the side, maybe in a nice way, maybe in a not such a nice way. So when we hear this, we've already heard so many changes of mood in this piece, very subtle little shifts, the dramatic opening, the... Um, uh, this, 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 the gentler string version, this lyrical piano version. They're all three, but they're using the same, they're, they're on the same subject. The melody, that melodic line, that motive, that's the subject of the conversation. That's the analogy I would make, that that's the subject of the conversation. And Mozart keeps varying how the subject is treated just the way we might, in a really good, in a really good conversation, find, find a way of doing that. Now, one thing that's very important uh, 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 that I want to also say is that we're very used to this now, but ever since Mozart and Haydn, all the way through the great 19th century, we'll see it in Brahms, co composers in the European classical tradition change moods all the time in their music. And we're so used to it. We don't, maybe you don't think of that as unusual anymore, but think about it. Think of all the popular songs you might know. If you go all the way back to the good old days of the, of the standards and Cole Porter and George Gershwin and, Harold and all those guys, or you're, maybe you're from the rock era you know, or the Beatles or the 70s or the 80s, once the song starts, that's it, right? That's the mood. The, most, almost all popular songs capture one mood, hold on to it for as long as the song takes, and end, right? They're, the number of songs that start, I love you, I love you, I love you, and by the end, I hate you, I hate you, <laughs> it doesn't happen. I'm sure there's a Broadway thing that does it, but basically it just doesn't happen. So there's a lot of difficulty, actually. It's, it's not easy to do what Mozart's doing, and one of the ways it, 
it, uh, the tendency is, if you keep changing moods, why aren't you changing the piece? Imagine if every one of those mood changes had a different melody. It'd be chaotic. You wouldn't know where you were. It would be, what holds it together is that they're talking about the same thing. They're just changing, they're just changing the way they're talking about it. As a, to use that metaphor. And, you know, it's, it's part of the process by which musicians, you know, the, the, one of the definitions of art is, is, is emotion recollected in tranquility. I think that's Wordsworth. Emotion remembered in tranquility. We all connect to the emotion. We all feel that, of course. But if there, if I think tranquility is a great metaphor for thinking through how it will make sense. How will I communicate those feelings to you? Because if you really want to see straight, pure emotion, go to group therapy, <laughs> right? That's where you'll see it. Because nobody's talking about the same thing. <laughs> so here you have this, this uh, the subject is that conversation, is that um, opening melody. And we see how he's changed mood, but held on to that over and over again. Well, let's move on now to, um, uh, example four, and the next example shows still another way to embed and decorate this musical idea. You'll hear the piano sort of in the background playing quick runs and so on, and the strings are going to play this motive we've come to recognize, uh, or do they? Well, let's hear example four. Julia, could I ask you to play just alone the two measures where you come in and measure 32? Just that. Start it. Do it one more time. See, See it starts right. Put it on dum, bum, bum. But then it goes on a little bit. Just like in a conversation, you might have an idea, you start it, then you think, wait a minute, you know, it reminds me of something else. And then a little later, Julia and Oriana, could you play together just in the same example, uh, measures 37 to 42? Yeah. You ever have a conversation where people keep interrupting each other? <laughs> could be done nicely, as it is here. Could be angry, could be resentful, could be... But here it is. It's another example of how, how I think this idea of conversation is so accurate. Let's, let's hear this uh, uh, example again. Let's hear example four again. We can all hear both the, both the way the motive drifts a little bit away, but even when it's done straight, at this point it gets interrupted and cut off, and we'll see how that works. <laughs> I think Adam's getting jealous. He, get, he doesn't get to do that. So why don't you play example five? This is a little port he does by himself. Yeah. Sometimes in, 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 in music, that kind of overlapping creates enormous intensity. It's a little more relaxed here, but that's often a vehicle where composers really rev up the tension. All right. Now, in a lot of these larger movements, there's a second melody. Another melody will come in, and that happens here. Uh, and Mozart, it seems, is not going to connect this to the first melody. Sometimes he does, sometimes he doesn't. But he does something very, tri very interesting here. So let's hear example six. This will have a little bit of the lead in to the new melody and then the new melody.
very pretty melody. And, and that it begins with a, with, its, with a little accent on the note, da, da, da. But then very surprisingly, he writes an accent, da, 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 ba. Could you play it once again? Just make, uh, yes, no, let's do the whole example again. But this time, bang out that second one more than your coach would like. <laughs> Just make it really obvious, so that because I, I want to make a little point about it. the same rhythm once you once you hear the accent as the opening. The opening is da ba 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 da ba and here it's da 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 da. It's exactly the same. Exactly the same rhythm. Mozart's a subtle guy. I don't know if he expected everybody to get that, but you know it's sort of there under the surface. You know, it's a it's a way of making connections that works psychologically, even if we don't consciously say, I've heard that. Wait a minute, that's the opening rhythm. But it's there. It's an odd accent. There's no other reason for it, really. And it creates this connection. Again, this is, this is, a, this is a, a very tightly knit movement. Let's get to um, example seven. And here, um, this large section is going to wind down now with a lovely little closing melody. But notice that the piano will do that little leap again that he did in the first melody and, and a little later. And then also, you'll hear, well, actually, Adam, why don't you play alone? before everybody plays, just measures 98 to 103. Yeah. That, that little da-da, 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 comes out of the opening. Bum, 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 ba-da, ba-da. Little sighing, little sighing figure. This guy doesn't waste anything. He's not letting anything go. He's using everything. All right. Uh, let's, hear this. let's hear this now. This is example seven. next example I want to play for you is when the main melody comes back just as we first heard it. it. It's very, very common in any movement of any size that the composer wants to get back to the beginning. He wants to come home. They, they want to come home. Some, usually it's somewhere around two-thirds, three-fourths of the way through, a big homecoming. And they may have gone off for a way. They've on, they're on a journey of some sort. The conversation's moved on. And they want to figure out how to get home to the exact thing or at least pretty much the exact thing. In this case, it will be the exact thing that uh, he started with. So what he does is, well, we'll see what he does, but basically he's going to fake you out. He's going to have a little, he's going to have a number of false ones. So you're going to hear this dum, bum, ba, ba, da, bum, but, it, but it's not right. It's not the right place. It's not the right notes. It's the right sound, right rhythm, but something's off. He'll get there eventually. Let's hear, uh, let's hear example eight. I didn't mean to. <laughs> was that? <laughs> I got carried away. But there, he got home. There's home. So you heard how many times he. No, oh, that wasn't it. No, oh, that wasn't it. And while he while he was trying to get there, everybody took a crack at going up the scale. Dun, 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 which is kind of an upside down version of dun, 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 what he, what what Adam was playing right right when when I cut him off inappropriately. All right. So 
It's a great, it's a great fake, and we're going to see actually Brahms has something a little similar too. A lot of composers really love clever ways of coming back home. They really think a lot about, I'm out here now and I have to get over here. How do I get there? You know. So one more example, and then we'll hear the whole piece. Let's have a, a, an example from towards the very end where the theme seems to come back still again, but but basically enough is enough, and so he really changes it a bit to push him toward the very end of the movement. So why don't we play example, this is example nine. So at the very end of the, it seemed to be exactly the same. At the very end, Adam's pian Adam's leap. Why don't you do the do the leap the way it is at the beginning? The, yeah, and now it, the way it is here. Yeah, more dramatic, more like okay, enough, enough. We're coming home. We're going to go to the end. All right. All right. Well, let's 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 hear this piece. I'm going to scoot over here, see if I can help out a bit. And so this is Mozart, the G minor. Piano quartet. Well, you know, I should tell you one last thing. I should I should tell you the publisher was very upset with this piece. He sent it off to be published, and the publisher wrote back. I think I have the quote here. Wait a minute. I think I wrote this. Yeah, the publisher said, "If you don't write more pop, write more popularly, or else I can neither print nor pay for anything of yours." <laughs> the uh, the 29-year-old Mozart, year old Mozart um, canceled the contract. <laughs> he was a headstrong, headstrong guy. Canceled the contract, and the next quartet he wrote had to go to some other publisher. So, by popularly, what he meant was easy. Make them easier to play. Not so easy. Okay.
was terrific. Now we all get to stretch for just a minute or so. If you want, you can stand up. I always remember there was a, um, remember the actor Hume Cronin? And he was, uh, he, he, he lived through near where, where I am and, and he, he would keep acting. He was like 88, 89 years old and he still would do regional stuff, he'd do anything. And somebody asked him, I said, what are you doing this for? Why are you still doing this? And he said, I'll tell you why I do this. Because when it says in the script, get out of the chair, you have to get out of the chair. <laughs> so if you want, you can get out of the chair, but don't go anywhere, because we're only gonna take about a minute to stretch and clear our minds, all right? So just come right, don't go anywhere. That's great. That's terrific. All right. All right, thank you so much. How you doing? That's right, that's right, that's right, that's right. How are you? Yeah, nice to see you. All right. So we're going to move to the Brahms Oops, sorry. The Brahms C minor quartet, the third movement. This is a, uh, has a bit of history to it. When Johannes Brahms was 20 years old, he screwed up his courage and he went to see his musical idol, Robert Schumann, who was at that point a pretty famous musician and he was actually at the end of his active career. He was in his late 40s, married to, of course, the great the pianist and uh, Clara Schumann, and uh, went to, he was also a music critic and wrote lots of music articles. So Brahms went to him with some of his music, and uh, Schumann looked at it, and he wrote a very famous bit of music criticism. I'll quote it. This would be nice to get if you're a 20-year-old composer. I thought he wrote, I thought of the paths of these chosen ones that pursue the art of music with the greatest participation. There must suddenly appear one who did not bring us the championship gradually, but like Minerva, would spring from the head of Zeus, fully formed, and he has come, a young blood, at whose cradle graces and heroes must have stood guard. His name is Johannes Brahms. Not bad. So Brahms pretty much, uh, almost pretty much moved in with the Schumanns, and then, <laughs> and then Robert Schumann uh, uh, went, uh, basically had a, a, a breakdown, and after a suicide attempt, he voluntarily went into an asylum, from which he never left. Brahms moved in with Clara and help take care of the seven kids. And guess what? Guess what happened? <laughs> so, well, we don't really know what happened, but we do know that Brahms fell, fell hopelessly in love with Clara. Clara was 14 years older than Brahms. She was 34, he was 20. But by this point, maybe a few years later. And um, he, he, they, it was a um, very, very difficult situation. And during this period, he sketched out what became this quartet. But Remembering what I was saying about emotion recollected in tranquility, this tr uh, quartet was not finished and published until 20 years later. So 
the, but the emotion is right out of that relationship. And much of this quartet is very passionate, very intense, uh, very intense and very, uh, very much uh, full of conflict. But not this movement as much. This is the third movement. This is really his love letter, his love letter to Clara. And, um, and the, the opening melody is definitely his love song to Clara. He called this, by the way, he himself called it somewhat tongue-in-cheek, because by this point, whatever had happened when he was younger, they formed a deep, lasting, and important musical friendship uh, for the rest of their lives. And they were, they were deeply committed friends, and that's, that's what they were. But um, he called this somewhat tongue-in-cheek his, his uh, Werther Quartet, Werther Quartet, based on the Goethe novel, The Sorrows of Young Werther. Some of you may know that novel. It was the catcher in the rye of its day. Everybody read it. Everybody read it. And it's about, it's basically about a, uh, a young man who falls in love with a married woman and is driven to suicide, suicidal thoughts and so on. And, and Brahm said, I, I am that. I was that man. I was that man. So let's hear the... Uh, opening of this, example one, and here is the melody of Laura and Adam play it. Beautiful, beautifully played in a beautiful melody. So it seems, oh, yes. Seems almost sacrilegious to tear this one apart a little bit, but I'm going to do it anyway. You know, let's try, I'd like to hear that, just the first four measures of that, and Adam, if you would play your, your backup, uh, instead of playing those chords off the beat the way they're written, play it right with the, the melody notes themselves. So that you don't change the notes, of course. Just ch play it with, just play it right with Laura rather than slightly off. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. And now, as written. Amazing, isn't it? Amazing difference. The, when, when you when you straighten it out, it almost becomes a hymn. It almost sounds like a uh, like a kind of quiet hymn. It takes some of the passion out of that melody, doesn't it? It's almost as if uh, maybe I'm being a little fanciful here, but uh, it's almost as if Laura is Clara. She's the melody is Clara, and Adam is Johannes with that his heart his heart beating. Da bum bum. It's sort of like that. Uh, 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 feeling of love, whereas when you straighten it out and it becomes more placid and more and 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 more gentle. I mean, a little fanciful, but it does make a big difference how he how he does that backup. But I'm not through yet. Laura, could you just play the first two measures? All even notes you hear, dun dun bum, and then just bum ba bum. No big deal, but hold on to that. We'll come back to that. And then if you play just the first four measures this time.
And again, no big deal, but there's that inside that, the rhythm of the melody. Dum, bum, 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 bum. Hold on to that as well. But let's for now move on to example two. Example two, and this is a very gentle, lovely, quiet moment where the violin and viola play a gentle rhythm over the piano and cello backing it up. So let's hear example two. And you hear it when, the, when, uh, when uh, um, Oriana and Julia do that. Bum, 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 bum. It's right out of the melody that I, I played there. Dum, bum, 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 bum. So the conversation continues with something from that melody into this lovely, gentle second kind of theme. But it even becomes more obvious in the, in the next new thing that happens. Let's hear example three all together. just to hear how that's all connected, it's all one seamless flow. Adam, maybe you could play just the very, just your little, just the first measure of example one, just the very opening that you play. Just the very beginning there, just, just that measure. Bum, ba, bum, bum, ba, bum. And then it's fine, bum, ba, bum. And then that's what they're doing, right? Bum, 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 bum. Um, and not only that, not only is that from the opening melody, but Laura, would you play measure 39 for us? Just that one little thing. Just and Oriana, measure 40. And Julia, measure 41. Yeah. There it is, from the opening. Da, 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 da. Da -dum, da -dum, da -dum. See, Brahms is like, uh, sort, of, sort of reminds me of my, uh, my grandmother in the kitchen. Nothing goes to waste. <laughs> Nothing goes to waste, you know? You know? Got some chicken feet left over? Dinner for four. You know? <laughs> but, uh, so, it seems like a small thing. Dun, da -da. But Brahms says, oh, I can do something with that. I think that's the idea of... The emotion is obvious in the melody, but recollected in tranquility is his ability to draw out of it much, much more than just the original statement. Maybe we should hear that example again. Example three. Now, you know, if Mozart had to come back to his original melody, you know Brahms has to come back to that melody. You have to hear that again. So, again, and as Mozart, he's going to find a very clever way to do it, and he's also going to try a, 
uh, uh, a fake. He's going to give you what you think is it, and it isn't it. So let's hear, let's hear this. This is example five, actually. We're going to let's hear this example, and then I'll talk a bit about it. This is example five. Laura, could you could you just play the um, when you come in there at um, measure seventy five? Whoops! Right, right, right. See, it starts it starts the melody pretty low, but it starts the melody, and then it wasn't it. It wasn't it. It's the piano that's going to get it. It's the piano that's going to get it. And um, uh, Julia, if you and Adam could just play right there at seventy, uh, where is that? Seventy eight. Uh, where the piano is now going to take the melody, and um, that kind of syncopated backup that he was doing, Julie is going to do it. Great, 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 great. Well, okay. Well, I think we ought to hear this whole movement. This is a, this is one of the great movements of all time. They need to tune again, you're all set? <laughs> Ready, okay.
Come on back. Come out, come out. to take a 15 minute break and we'll come back and do some tangos. Good afternoon. My name is Kate Sheeran. I'm the executive director here at Kaufman Music Center and we're so delighted to partner with One Day University for this afternoon of listening and learning. And before we hear some wonderful tango music, I wanna tell you a little bit more about Kaufman Music Center and our students. Uh, learning and listening are really at the heart of what we do here. Over 50,000 people come to concerts here in Merkin Hall every year, and we also have 4,000 students who come to our educational programs every year. One of those programs is Special Music School. You are hearing the students from Special Music School High School this afternoon. Um, it's kind of an amazing program, Special Music School. It started about 23 years ago uh, as an elementary school, and then we added a middle school, and then we added a high school six years ago. It's a partnership with the New York City uh, Department of Education, and so it's a public school. So students who uh, you know, go through their high school day, they might start with English, and then trigonometry, and then music history, a cello lesson, uh, maybe an ensemble in the afternoon, all within the context of a school day. And because it's a public school and it's a partnership, they get all of this at no cost, which means this wonderful education is accessible to young New Yorkers uh, regardless of financial means. And that's because Kaufman Music Center uh, fundraises for and provides and really believes in this music education. Uh, these students, not only you've already heard some of the wonderful playing, but I'll also tell you that those of, us, those of us adults who get to spend time with them know that they're kind and collaborative and they support each other and we're just very proud of them. So if you are inspired as we are every day by our students and you want to help us um, with this, the best way to do it is uh, to come to concerts here, continue to support our students, or if you wanna help us in fundraising, for Special Music School to help get the word out through many channels, or give us a gift today if you feel so inspired. There's an envelope in your program. Um, we believe in this education and we'll continue to support it for many years to come. I also wanna recommend a few concerts if this is your first time here at Merkin Hall. There's a listing of uh, concerts in your program, and I'd like to recommend Tuesday matinees as something you might enjoy. It's an, another chance to catch classical music stars on the rise. Uh, in that case, they are young career, uh, early career professionals. So you kind of see the next stage of growth after uh, students in school. So thank you for being here and enjoy the piazzola and back to Professor Grossman. Uh, just, just to echo what she said, it, it's been an amazing experience for me to work with these talented students and, and really the Board, they're professionals already, and uh, it's such a thrill. I'm so grateful to Egal Kesselman, who runs the school and, and, uh, and uh, has allowed me to work with them. It's been a terrific experience. Well, all right. Now, we had uh, Mozart in 1785. Brahms is about 1860, another 100 years or so. We're into the 20th century with Astor Piazzolla, who uh, is... Argentinian by way of Italy. His family em emigrated from Italy, so if you like to pronounce it in the Spanish way, it's Piazzolla. If you'd like to keep his Italian roots close to your mind, it's Piazzolla. <laughs> now, he, he, um, he's gotten to be very, very popular. Everybody likes playing Piazzolla, but there's something mysterious about it that, I, that bothered me for a while, because he's so associated with the tango, as well he should be. He grew up with the tango. He was his basic instrument was the was the one instrument that you need for the for the pure tango. You know the bendonium. You ever see that thing? It looks like an accordion, but there's no keyboard. But it works like bellows. But it has these buttons on both sides of it, and the buttons play different notes depending on whether you're going in, and then you go out. All the buttons change notes. It's fiendish. It's bizarre. It's a fiendish instrument. 
I've been told. I've been told. It drives people crazy who try to learn it. And they play it in the tango. It's obviously very big in Argentina. It's very big in, in, in Uruguay, where they do tangos too. But they're all made in Germany. <laughs> it's true. At least until very recently. All during, certainly, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. Nobody, I don't know why. Maybe somebody knows why. They're all import, they were all imported. At any rate, that was his instrument. So most of the music that we hear, including this piece, he wrote it for his group that included him, of course, as the Bendonian player, and they tend to be arranged by other people, and he did many arrangements as well. But he did not write classical old tangos. He didn't when he was very young, but he always had a classical bent, and when he was quite young, he met Arthur Rubinstein, the great pianist who was living in Buenos Aires, and suggested he study more classical works with uh, Alberto Ginastera, Ginastera, who was the major Argentinian composer, and he took lessons. And then in his early 20s, he went to Paris and studied with the great teacher of all time, everybody's favorite, everybody has a story about Nadia Boulanger. Nadia Boulanger was the great French teacher who taught Aaron Copland, many Americans, and famously said to Aaron Copland, uh, you know, you have, you've learned all this European stuff, but you've got to figure out what it means to be an American composer. And Copeland went out and, you know, wrote Rodeo and Appalachian Spring and so on. Turns out he said that she said the same thing to uh, Piazzolla, who had basically given up the tango. He said, I'm not writing these tangos anymore. I'm going to write my classical pieces. Showed them to her, and she looked at them. Very nice, very nice. Could, I know you've written some other things, and so finally she pushed him to... to um, and play one of his tangos, and she said, that's it. You've got to figure out how to develop that into whatever you want to do. And so uh, I guess that was her big thing as a teacher, right? Find out who you are. Find out who you are and figure out how you build from there. So he went back and developed what he called the new tango. But it's really a combination of uh, a, a sort of um, authentic tango, the dance tango, and um, lots of other elements he picked up both from his love of classical music, particularly Baroque music. He loved the old stuff. As you maybe you can tell from the title of the pieces, these are two movements we're going to hear from the Four Seasons. So he, he knew something about Vivaldi. So he loved Baroque mu music, and also he loved jazz and played lots of times with, j with jazz musicians. And we're going to see all these influences come together. And he sort of does for the tango what maybe you might think of Gershwin doing for popular music in his big classical pieces. They're not obviously popular songs, but all that popular music he loved and wrote in, in another, you know, are inside of Rhapsody in Blue or inside of his concerto and so on. Um, and it, it's somewhat similar to that, that while they, they are, you will hear tango rhythms here and there, not all the time, but they pop in sometimes very dramatically, but the spirit of the tango is always behind the scenes. And maybe I could just demonstrate one quick thing but gee, if I can, if I can just come over here. So there are, there are a number of basic rhythms in the tango. One of them der derives out of what used to be, what is called sometimes the habanera. And everybody knows the famous one, right, from Bizet's Carmen. Right? What you always need is a very steady rhythm and then a sinewy, sinuous kind of melody above it. And that you'll hear a number of times that will happen. But that rhythm, if you take that rhythm, by the way, the habanera literally means that thing from Havana. <laughs> That's what it literally means. So, you know, while the tango is associated with Argentina, you know, it's a Latin American flavor in a lot of those dances. Now, if you leave out the, the third one of these four, I'm going to leave. Now I'm into the real tango. Right? Right? Here's a Scott Joplin thing where he does.
he called this piece Mexican Serenade. So the tango is sort of a floating around in, 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 in simpler versions like that. What Piazzolla is going to do is elevate it into a real art form and embed it inside of more complex music, but always with the feeling, the spirit of the tango around. So let's take a, let's take a listen with uh, winter. We'll start with winter. We'll go, and we'll go through some excerpts of both of them because I think it's nice to hear these two pieces together. So we'll, we'll go through both of these and just have a few excerpts. So it's winter, it's, it's winter in Buenos Aires, and as you can expect, there's, a, sort, of a, there's sort of a darkness and a, 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 an intensity and passion inside of the tango that comes out of winter. Um, there's, a, there's a beautiful melody that dominates this piece. It comes back maybe five times, and everybody gets a shot at it. So you really want to get a handle on this uh, opening melody. And it's a characteristic Piazzolla melody. It's, it's passionate. It's grounded to, to a, uh, a steady rhythm, perhaps, but, it's, but it has a, an enormous amount of passion to it. Let's hear, let's hear the beginning of this. This is example one. That melody is going to come back. The piano has a great version of it. Let's hear example two, just to get a feeling of it. And you know, there are, there are about three times this basic mood is interrupted by faster, more, more dance-oriented, tango-oriented moments. And here's one of them, and you really can hear it. Let's hear example three. Yeah, yeah. I was going to ask them to repeat that to bring out the accents, but they brought out the accents. So right? that, that was fabulous. They did exactly right. That's the tango rhythm, right? Dum, bum, 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 bum. Long, long, short, another way to think of it. And um, that's the classic tango pattern of, of, of rhythm. Um, and he does that. And you'll hear it on and off. I'm not going to bring out, I'm not going to, you know, have them play every single time. It's clear. It comes in and out. It's always around. It's always part of the flavor of it. But I think the mis misunderstanding I used to have about Piazzolla, maybe, maybe some of you do have this, is that, is that they're really like dance tangos. And you're going, nobody can dance to this. <laughs> this is not a dance tango. It's sort of like a Ravel writing waltzes. Yeah, they're waltzes. You're not going to dance to them. So it's really, when he said, called them the new tango, what he meant was this, this new kind of formula that he's, that he's going to develop. Well, the next time we hear the melody, it's, it's in the cello. And each time the melody returns, by the way, one of the things to notice is it's always subtly different. The backup changes the feeling and the flavor of the melody. So here, for example, uh, the piano's going to play a little steadier in her left hand, as, as you'll hear. Why don't you, maybe you could start that just a bit, the example four, um, uh, Lucia. Just to, so they can hear that steady left hand there by yourself. Can you do that by yourself just for a second? Just a. It is very steady. Yeah, good. That's all right. Um, now, let's, let's play the whole example for everybody.
Right, and I think, you know, this melody is so beautiful, but I don't want you to he hear it all the way through every time, because when you hear it in their performance, it's just stunning how, how it develops and becomes uh, um, so emotional. One last crack at how this melody can be changed, and that's uh, example five, where we're going to hear it begins, the violin begins, and then the cello will join, and the, even the piano gets more into the spirit of the actual motion of the music. This is the last version of this melody, so it's, um, it's appropriate that it, it's sort of the peak, the peak moment here. Example five. Beautiful, beautiful. Now his love of the Baroque comes out at the end because he has a great way to wind the piece down. And I'm gonna ask uh, Lucia again to play just her left hand just for a minute and get a little sense of this. If you could play uh, an example six, uh, just your left hand here. Anybody hear Pachelbel's Canon? It's going to be, it's going to be like that's the classic Baroque uh, uh, thing about going down the left. The, the well, usually it's the cello, but some instrument down low, just walking down the scale, and above it, as you'll hear, the uh, figurations and, and things, melodies above it, and the and the pattern, the left hand pattern, just continues. They sometimes call that an. Uh, 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 ostinato, which, which is Italian for obstinate, repetitive, repetitive. Sometimes they go on for a long time. Here, I think he does it three or four times, but you'll hear that left hand do it. In some Baroque pieces, it'll, it'll be like 20 times, and the, the trick is to decorate it differently every time, you know? But he does it uh, about three or four times, I think. So let's hear, the, let's hear this uh, in example six, everybody. Okay, now I want to move on to spring. Spring is, as you might expect, filled with a lot more energy. And here we're going to see all of his influences coming together. His, the tango, of course. His, his love of jazz, we'll hear that uh, as well. And also his love of, another thing he loved about Baroque music is the way you can have more than one melody line at the same time. Think of the Bach piece and everybody's doing their mel melodic lines and it's very, very busy. It's a lot of activity, very, very busy. And he, so we'll, we'll hear all of those things together here in this, in this wonderful piece. Um, let's start just by playing example one of spring. This is moving on to spring. Okay, let's, let's everybody play. Now, if I can have uh, just Gio, if you could play your part alone. Yeah, you hear the jazz influence right away, right? And uh, jazz basses started doing that in the 30s. That was sort of the, the, the old style of the 20s with more Dixieland, with more just playing bass notes. And, uh, and, but but the, the new swing style in the 30s demanded the walking bass. And so you started to get these walking bass movements that build up energy. You hear it in all the, not only in all the big bands, but in all the small groups too. And that go, they still play that way. 
You know, even, even, in, even sometimes in wild experimental jazz, the bass players are still doing that kind of hard-edged walking bass. So, uh, so it's, it, it became the way jazz bassists have to play, a lot, if not all the time, a lot of the time. Now, while, while, he, while, while Jake's doing that, um, Lucia, you're doing something too. Let's have just uh, Jake and Lucia play the opening, example one. All right, so she's doing the tango. Bum, bum. She's getting that tango rhythm in there. And Moises is doing something too. Well, why don't you all play together now? Because he's the one you, it's easy to hear. Great. Now, as this continues, Lucia is going to pick up the bass line. Why don't you play just your left hand for a minute? That's fine. Okay. I'm gonna, and then I'll play both hands together, uh, just the first four measures there. Yeah, she's had to pick up. The, ba the bass, she's doing the bass line now, she's doing the jazz thing now, and she's doing what she had been doing, the tango rhythm in her right hand. Now, meanwhile, what's the cello going to do? Let's see what the cello does. Why don't you play four, your four first four measures of this is the example two here. His own melodic line sort of sounds roughly similar to the violin, not exactly the same, but basically in that style of rhythmic energy. And uh, Moises, what are you doing? You know, what are your first four measures? Oh my God. Ah, didn't, he didn't stop and rest. So you really have two melody lines going head to head with each other while Lucia on the piano there is doing both the jazz bass line and the little tango interruptions. Let's do it. Let's do example two, everybody. All right, all right. All right, one more. One more. Can it get any more complicated? All right. <laughs> Why don't you play your first uh, four measures, Lucia, in the, the example three? Yeah, so she has the bass. She's, she's still doing the jazz bass, but now she's joining the fun. She's joining the melody lines, right? So she's doing what the violin started with. Dum, bum, 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 bum. She's doing it in her right hand. So maybe the strings get a rest this time? How about playing the first four measures of example three in the cello? Oh dear. Okay, how about noises? How about the first four measures in the violin? <laughs> All right, let's hear it. All, th all three of you, example three. Yeah, well, that example really captures Piazzolla's one of one one quality. That I think one of the interesting qualities where you, everything's all there. There's the feeling, the backup feeling of the tango inside of those rhythms. Dum, ba -bum, ba -bum. The bass, the, the jazz bass line, either in the either at first in the in the cello and then in the piano, and then his love of intricate counterpoint, the idea of combining different melodic lines together in what musicians call polyphony, many poly, many phone sound, many sounds, many lines, polyphony, and that is what is at the heart of Baroque music. So he has 
the jazz, he has the tango. This is, if Vivaldi had only gone to Argentina, this is, this is what he would have, this is what would have happened. Now, most of this movement, particularly the chunk at the beginning and the chunk at the end, are in this style. But he also has this uh, beautiful middle section, one of his great, great melodies. It really rivals the beautiful melody he had in winter. So let's hear just a little bit of this melody in the, uh, for the cello in uh, example four. Well, I think we should hear these pieces, winter, winter and spring, from the Four Seasons. He didn't originally, by the way, write it as a, as a coherent suite. He wrote them sort of separate pieces, but obviously at some point he said, wait a minute, <laughs> I just need one more season. So uh, it became, it, 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 it often is played now as a, as a full suite, but the individual movements are independent. All right, so winter and spring, and I'm going to see if I can help out a little bit.
fabulous musicians. This is sort of a presentation and a concert, so I don't know if anybody has any questions for either for our fine musicians here or for me, but if so, I believe Mr. Schragas has the microphone. We do have units, so if you have a question, I'll bring the microphone to you. But, um, yeah, hold on. First, I want to thank you for enhancing my enjoyment enormously on all the three pieces. But um, I'm curious, the way you put it together, it makes so much sense. But I, I'm, I'm wondering about the distinction for the composer. Is it celebration or inspiration or 50-50 or what? Well, I, I, I like that little metaphor about emotion recollected in tranquility because I think the passion has to be there, of course. The talent has to be there. But they do. Uh, some very obviously, you, you, they leave manuscripts and you can really see them crossing things out and putting things in. You really see the thought process. Others like Mozart seem to do it all in his head. And what comes out is the piece. But either way, really, I'm not sure it's that different because what Mozart could do it in his head. Beethoven is, has nine different drafts of every piece, you know. So, but I think they all have to take that emotion and figure out a way to communicate it, and that takes thought and effort, and, and uh, sometimes it's pure musical skill, but other times it's the energy and it's the concentration to th consider what would an audience hear, what do I want to say, how do I want to bring it, you know, to be really thoughtful about it. So I, I think uh, while, while it's, it's certainly possible to read, read more into something than is really there, I, I know that critics often do that, I think, but I, I think that for the most part, um, musicians are very thoughtful about um, about what they're, about how they're communicating to an audience. Yeah. Uh, thanks to everyone, and uh, thank you, Mr. Grossman, Professor Grossman. You mentioned earlier today the motive. Is yeah. That, is that equivalent to or analogous to the refrain in popular music? Is there any? Similarity? You know what it's analogous to is more to the to to what jazz musicians and rock musicians call a riff. A riff, which is usually like a, it could be like four notes that the jazz musician might play da 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 or something like that, and then it comes back and comes back and comes back. A refrain's a little longer, I think, usually. Think of a refrain as more of a, a longer thing that does repeat. But uh, a motive is, is too short to be a melody, and that's part of, you know, it's like it's just a, it's just a fragment. And it, by being used a number of ways, a number of times, we start remembering it, we start identifying with it. I think, I think it's what rock musicians call a riff. And there are some jazz, famous jazz pieces where there's hardly any melody. It's, they're called riff songs, where it's just like a rhythm riff over here and a rhythm riff over there. And there's really not much of a melody, but it's just all riffs tossed back and forth. Yeah. Yep. I, I'm just curious. This is for the students. How many hours a day, in addition to your regular homework, do you practice your musician talents? Can people hear you? You want? So it also depends on the homework I have, but I would say around three hours a day. Yeah, after school, of course. Um, it, it depends on the day. It depends on what I need to work on. Uh, but on a good day, probably around six. Ooh, whoa, <laughs> whoa! I, I don't get much sleep. But it's fine. <laughs> Um, so my priority is music, so um, basically I do five to six a day, wow. in vacation whole day, um, sometimes whole day, yeah. Wow. Okay, why don't we do two more questions and then it'll be done here, uh, there and then over there, okay? Okay, this is for the students and I know nothing, I can't even find middle C, so I'm in awe of everything I'm watching, believe me. But I really wonder, for the, especially for the strings, is there a preference of jazz? Play? I mean, strings, you, you play it like it's jazz when it's this kind of music. And it's so wonderful. And I always think of strings as 
classic or opera or only. Do you have a preference of the two, of playing jazz or? Um, so me, um, I am very conservative classical musician, so of course I, I do classical music, so my personal preference is so classical and romantic era piece, like all those stuffs. I of course do um, contemporary stuff, which is also requirement, and I work on it because I have to understand the new language of music. But I think um, as a conservative, I mean musically conservative uh, musician, I think it's um, since it's classical music, as it means, um, I prefer classical music because um, that's the original language. A quick game. Oh. So yeah, I would say classical music too. But as a musician, I'm also often to like listening to other kind of music. But that's my side. <laughs> yeah. Um, so for me, I, I although. My brain right now is more wired to classical music. I really enjoy jazz as well. And something about special music school is we're exposed to all sorts of jazz and like pop, everything. There are students doing everything. And whenever I see jazz musicians doing their thing, I'm just like, whoa, that's incredible. And I learn from them as well. So. <laughs> One last question here. Um, where do you uh, come from? Uh, did you have to take a test to get into the school? Are you from uh, the city or are you from all over the world? Where, where are you from? Uh, I'm from Korea. I'm from Korea. Um, this is my fifth year in the East. Also, the Korean Peninsula. Well, here. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I'm from Korea, this is my fifth year, and he's from Venezuela, it's his second year. And she's from Australia, it's her. Yeah, I'm from Australia. I've been in New York City for four years, but special music school, this is my second year. And we're all seniors as well. Yeah. Anyway. I wanna thank, thank you all for coming. Hope you enjoyed it. It's very exciting for us at One Day U to do partnerships like this. Thank you for attending. Thank you very much. And thank you everyone from the Kauffman Music Center. And thank you, Professor Grossman. And thank you.